This episode of The Candid Frame is brought to you by the Charcoal Book Club. Their carefully curated selection reflects the most contemporary photography for a reasonable price, and they are delivered directly to your doorstep each month. They offer free shipping to the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. It's subsidized elsewhere. It's a great way to begin or expand your photo library. Join the club at charcoalbookclub.com today and remember to use the code THECANDIDFRAME at checkout and receive a 10% discount on your first membership payment. Our family has experienced its share of loss over the past several months, not least of which is my Uncle Chino, my Aunt Jenny, and my mother-in-law, Faithy. I know I'm at an age where this is to be expected, but it doesn't diminish the pain or the grief. But it does remind me of the importance of shared moments, whether they occurred days or years ago. The blessing of photography has allowed me to document and share those special moments with my subjects, my family, and my audience. Those moments are just as important as the resulting photography. Photographer Norman Seif understands that, and his images are the better for it. Whether he's photographing musicians or strangers, he values the power of humanity, dignity, and humility. This conversation reminds me that photography can be more than just taking pictures. This is Ibarian X, and welcome back to The Candid Frame. When I was looking at your photographs, there, what, what amazed me was the genuineness that I was seeing in all the photographs. And I was really curious about how you evoked that. But when I saw the behind the scenes, it made complete sense. You know, because what I saw there was not so much a preoccupation with the image, though you are a photographer, but that you were evoking a moment between you and the subject. And I don't see that very often, if at all. I was just fascinated watching those things and then looking at the photographs again, and then having that understanding that you're sharing a moment with someone, and it just so happens you, you're making photographs that sort of crystallize exactly. that moment. Exactly. Uh, well, I want to commend you on your perspective, because that's exactly the way I work, which is not to aim at a goal, but to create a relationship with my subject. And the idea about the relationship is a peer-to-peer -peer conversation between human beings that are multi-level conversations. There is the outer form, you know, the taking the image, but in a sense for me, uh, and I've, I'm, I think you must have become aware that I've had many, many different careers. Mm -hmm. One of them was as a medical emergency doctor in Soweto in South Africa. And uh, that at a certain point, it became an act of safety for me to get out of the country because it was the time of apartheid in South Africa. And I did not agree with that that mm -hmm. worldview and they did not agree with mine. Although I was doing really wonderful, amazing, profound and meaningful work in the hospital, at which at that time Soweto was a, a separated black community from Johannesburg, which was all white. And I elected when I qualified to go and work in Soweto and then discovered that it was basically warfront environment and found that I was not that I wanted to be there, but it was necessary to work in the emergency world. During that time, I ran uh, an art school at night and taught drawing because I've always had this duality of a sort of a visual ability from early on, as well as my fascination on the dynamics of how things work. So it was a sort of a combination of which way do I want to go in life, although I never thought of that in the beginning. My father was a doctor. My brother is a very famous research worker uh, who happens to be here in Washington. But basically, I went into medicine with the idea that this was a healing art, 
But we'll discuss that further on because I could sort of go on. But the whole point is that at a certain point, I bought a one-way ticket to New York, so you can extrapolate what that means. <laughs> I came to New York with one little camera in my hand and couldn't practice medicine here. So I had to make some kind of way of survival the priority, and I just started walking the streets of New York and stopping people who I thought were fascinating and saying that I wanted to photograph them and could I go to their homes or get them into a studio if I had access to that. And it just started to find myself moving into an arena that was not necessarily, you know, I didn't wake up with a vision of a, a camera in my hand or being a photographer. I was really responding to how do you deal with the inequities of human treatment and, and injustice in South Africa. So my fascination became about ultimately how do you bring about change rather than just trying to fix a broken down system with no change and uh, found myself having to survive. So, you know, that was me sort of entering the world of photography, not as a childhood passion, but as a stepping stone along a desire to engage in the creative process in all the different forms. So photography is not my only form of expression, creative expression. Well, in the conversation you had with Herbie Hancock during your photo session with him, he talks about he was studying something else other than the creative art. And one day he said, of look himself in the mirror and realize, who am I kidding? Making music is what I'm, I'm, I'm meant to do. Right. And like you said, you were a medical doctor before, and though you were dealing with the practical nature that you didn't, you couldn't practice medicine in, in the States, you likely had a similar moment, I would assume, that you kind of realized, not just because you got to keep a roof over your head, but that this is, yeah. this is something that I need to do. Yeah. Uh, I have a similar moment every day, uh, every second is <laughs> what is the focus of this lifetime and the impact that I want to have and the service that I want to participate in. So, you know, I, the way I, I think the best way to describe it is this function and form. In a sense, when I was fully engaged in being a photographer and it started as a quote unquote rock photographer in New York, the form was taking photographs, the form was building a portfolio, the form was finding my voice as a photographer that was unique to me and the ability to have people decide they want me to shoot them and pay me. The function was something that I didn't quite understand as clearly as I do now, but it's an evolving function. But actually, without getting too esoteric, my fascination is about the nature of human consciousness, the evolution of human consciousness, the way that humans have the ability to take what is inside and express outwardly in various modalities, whether you're photographing or writing or making a movie. But what I became fascinated with to jump, you know, many years into my career here as a photographer was, well, who are we when we function at the high reaches of human potential and human creativity? The true nature of being human, which, as you know, can express along a, a spectrum, a range of possibilities from the worst instincts of hu human inequity to who we can be in the future. So what was fascinating to me as I got more successful is I had all these amazing multidisciplinary creators coming to my studio. So I could spend a couple of hours with Stevie Wonder or Joni Mitchell, or as we start, as I started moving out of the music business, working with directors and actors and writers and athletes, I would have Scorsese in my studio, and I could say, "Well, you know, I'm fascinated and I love your your work, but I'm not interested as much in this particular circumstance in what you did. I'm more interested in how you do what you do." So I used the photo session as a way to do the inner journey, explore the inner nature of their creative individual process. And yes, I used that and that spontaneous experience 
that we were having, and, and your way of describing it in the beginning was spot on. <clears throat> I, I see myself as an experientialist in the sense of I can create an authentic, emotionally real experience in the moment. I just document what's happening. So I'm not a documentary cameraman who, you know, I, I never shot concerts where you, you know, you watch what's going on and your timing has to be really beautiful and impeccable for that particular art form. My interest was to bring a human being into an environment where I could create an intense, intimate, emotional relationship. And the two of us now become engaged in communication and the emotional experience, which builds and builds and builds till you get into a level of, you know, the cliche name for it is the zone, but it's a place of, for me, soul to soul connection. And something starts to happen that has a resonant field of energy in it. And I call that resonant field of energy an old fashioned word. It's called love. Mm. <laughs> you can create a genuine, authentic, loving, trusting relationship with someone else. They look at you in a different way than if they don't feel safe with you. So for me, photography became the outer form of you know a particular function i mean a particular form but the function was what is the nature of human communication what is the nature of creating intimate trusting relationship and in that process of creating genuinely creating experience but it was a collaborative thing both of us had to engage and desire to do the same thing i would just document what was happening moment by moment and then later on, it took many, many years for me to realize, oh, I think I'm getting something good because I used to hate my photography for decades <laughs> before that. I always thought it was, always thought, you know, oh, the, because I, I didn't learn anything about the, tech, the technical side of it. It wasn't the focus and it wasn't, you know, I wasn't using a, a large camera. I was using a, a 35 because my stuff is so fast. I had to be shooting almost a frame a second for you know, two to three hours. And so I always thought, oh, it's, you know, I don't like the grain and I, I don't understand, you know, how to get the certain kinds of shadow light qualities. And so I kind of, uh, I got co-opted into looking at it from that point of view. And then at a certain point, I went away from photography and I, for 15 years, I became a very, very successful director of television commercials and shot the biggest campaigns for the Fortune 500 from Steve Jobs's, you know, Apple computer and, you know, all of the car companies. And I put my photography away and never looked at them, never had a picture up. In fact, I never used to like to have my pictures up because I was always critical. <laughs> so it was only after that career, one day I came back and I looked at uh, some pictures and I went, mm, maybe there's something else in here that I was in fact consciously creating, but I wasn't valuing as I can now see from a different perspective. So that, that criticalness that you had of those, of those photographs and that led you to move away from them, was it a critique of your technical proficiency in terms of lighting and other things? Are you, were you judging it based on those things, especially in comparisons to what other of your contemporaries may have been doing? Um, it was sort of partially the technical side of it. I mean, looked at it and I thought, gee, you know, how do I get better grain and better detail? What I was doing, though, which was in fact what I can now appreciate, the art form was the art form of communication and the art form of relationship and the art form of trying to blend emotionally with a sense of, compassion and caring and understanding other human beings. I mean, I wasn't going out of, if I was in Africa and I was photographing in Soweto, I would have been photographing, you know, the tragedy and the injustice of humanity. But that would be me being a documentary photographer and very, very different to what happened. It just so happened that as a result of meeting when I was in New York, and I, I was in New York for three years, uh, I met a very famous graphic designer in the world of, uh, of music, of, 
uh, you know, album cover art and art director. His name was Bob Cato. You know, in my desperation to try and survive, I was introduced to him and had this experience of a very highly successful man who was like consultant to Columbia Records and to Time Life, sitting down and very, very slowly turning the pages of my portfolio instead of like, you know, flip, 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 thanks. You know, Mm -hmm. he looked at every picture and then I saw him look up at me and his eyes were wet with tears. And in that moment I had like, oh, my God, this is going to be okay because, you know, my first phase in New York where I knew nothing about photography, but I always had an eye. And I, I also was not very comfortable with emotional interaction because as a medical doctor, this is a little overcritical, but this was the general tone of medicine in those days where they were basically saying, do not get emotionally involved with your patient because you won't be objective. And, you know, emotions were thought of as something that got in the way of intellectual understanding. And um, suddenly I find myself in a world where I'm standing six feet away from Ike and Tina Turner. I don't know much about American culture and, and humanity as of yet. I'm still trying to find my way and I don't really know how to, within that three to four hours of doing a session, how do you can insert um, your desire to have a very deep emotional relationship that normally would take years to build up within three hours so that there's an intimacy. So I went into terror uh, in the beginning. I was terrified, not of my visual and aesthetic ability, but my ability to connect emotionally and authentically. So in fact, my art work, you know, my works, my challenge became more about the nature of communication, human communication, human connectivity, you know, intimacy, vulnerability. Uh, that scared me. And where I came from, you, do, you couldn't show vulnerability. Your life was in danger. So you had to put on a, a veneer of, I'm cool, I'm not scared, you know, and I suddenly find myself terrified. The the thought came up, well, if you're scared, you know, you can't be an artist. They all look so spontaneous and uh, and confident. So it's very clear reflection that this is not your nature and, you know, it shouldn't be something that you came to America in the spontaneousness of the moment thinking, hey, I could just walk into New York with, you know, 400,000 people trying to get the same job mm-hmm. and survive. So, you know, the, the, the terror that came up was not terror of survival, but in fact it was the reality of survival. But it was more the terror of being humiliating myself, not being good enough, uh, not being competent enough, self-doubt. And also what happened was when I started you know, moving into in this new career, I felt, what have I done? How could I leave South Africa and the, the very important work that I was doing uh, for this kind of frivolity that I was kind of, it was, the, it was the lenses that I was looking at the whole New York scene and, you know, fashion, yeah. and I didn't want to do fashion, you know, I didn't know about the music business. So, uh, you know, my, my journey is really, I'm talking not about photography so much, as the way of the artist Mm -hmm. and i didn't understand it as a way and as you know as a professional artist it is a way it's a way of seeing the world it's a way of walking through the world it's a way of writing a story it's a way of self-reflection on who are you and what are these eyes seeing because it's not the eyes that are seen it's my consciousness that is observing the world and i'm sure that's how you shoot Oh, the way I shoot and the way I, you know, do this show. Everything you've just described is exactly what I experience when I'm producing an, an episode. <laughs> it's it's everything. There's, it's like, there's fear, there's anxiety, there's self-doubt. There have been many an episode that I've done and I've stopped the recording button and go, well, that was crap. And then I get all these emails from people saying, it was wonderful. It's the best thing I ever heard from you. 
And it just let me know that I have right. no idea at all, other than the fact that I'm, I've learned how to create the moment between me and the other person I'm in the room with, or, or I'm sharing a screen with as, as, as with you. And that I've yeah. come to understand what I need to do in order to create the space. And then I can just let things play out. The anxiety, the self doubt is still there. I acknowledge it, but then I go, yeah, you're there, but I still got to do the work. And right. then I, I trust, I trust the years of experience to guide me to wherever I need to, to go. But like you, if you asked me immediately afterwards, you know, to judge it or rate it, I wouldn't be able to, to tell you. <laughs> I just know that I did it, <laughs> that I finished it, and it's for other people to decide whether or not it's good, bad, or indifferent. Well, you see what's beautiful about you, and I'm just going to jump very quickly to the, the perception. You come in with a very clean motivation and a purpose to connect, and that is the true function for me of what you're doing. And then there's the sort of form, the way that you've learned through your experience. Now, what's fascinating, and I think you'll find this amazing, or as I found it amazing, you know, as I did more and more sessions and I became successful it felt like forever, but within a year and a half, I was sort of like the hot new rock photographer in New York. And a lot of people were coming to me and I was having the experience of shooting and shooting and shooting. I began to realize, wait a minute, uh, my sessions are not these sort of random things that happen that you never know what's going to happen next. There is a kind of structure of the way it unfolds. And, of course, it begins where you initiate something. And at that moment of initiation is, is the dread and the fear and the demons. And, the, and then I went through this next second phase of the structure of the session, which I now call the oh shit phase, which is <laughs> all the fear comes up and all the uncertainty comes up. And you then have to make an innate decision. You either back away and resign or you go through that doorway, through the threshold, in spite of your fear. So that's an act of courage that is required. And then, you know, following that, there are other stages in the archetype of the creative process, which I began to unfold for myself. But what I began to realize as I was working with artists is that they were going through the same dynamic. So my focus changed to... And all the, all of the words that you use, you create a space, as you say, I create, I see what I'm doing, I create a space, it's a create a space of safety and uh, a, a vulnerability on your part and an honesty and I can talk to you intuitively and three words into our conversation get this is a man who uh, really is authentically searching, you know, in a, in a very uh, beautiful, vulnerable, real way and that you're safe. If you weren't safe to me, I would. I know. I know how to handle that because I've had situations with artists that come out, and sometimes they come at you in various ways. Uh, but it's usually because of fear. So what I started doing uh, is like doing exactly as you're talking about. You create an environment uh, in order for the artist to feel safe. You know, in the beginning, I went. How do you get people to be spontaneously? themselves in front of the camera instead of, you know, putting on a sort of persona. And I had that happen with many artists coming in, understandably feeling the necessity to be self-protective. And what I had to do is create the space and then the fear came up, well, if you're going to ask someone to let go of their defences and be real, which is about really being emotionally open and emotionally real, I had to be the first one to do it. Absolutely. And that was like, <laughs> that was the frightening part of it. But I went on to, uh, the, the best way I can say, uh, I went on a methodical journey of beginning to learn who I am by going very, very deeply into my own emotional uh, realities. If I'm frightened or if I'm insecure or if I'm feeling judgmental, you know, which is not an emotion, but is mental construct that is separating. But the work became an internal journey together with learning the skill sets and also with the experience of hundreds of sessions, 
you begin to see that underneath what looks like a, a sort of random chaotic experience, there is order, there is order in the chaos. And so what started happening as I'm shooting and I'm, I love what I'm getting emotionally, mm -hmm. I just didn't like them technically because if I could get to that experience of connectedness with someone, and I have to say that I did, in spite of my fear, get there. It would take, in the beginning, maybe an hour and a half of three good double scotches in a joint because it was became an artificial crutch, you know, uh, because it was hard to handle the fear. And I also loved to have a good time, you know, and that everyone was doing the same thing. But at a certain point, I started thinking, you know, getting to the authentic moment and using substitutes for being real and vulnerable in the moment, there was something hypocritical about it. So mm -hmm. at a certain point, and I'm not an alcoholic and I'm not a drug guy because I, I didn't need it in living life. I, I sort of used it as a tool when I started shooting to kind of give me a little false sense of more spontaneity, you know, not be so in my mental way of looking at things. Uh, I have the capacity to go both ways. But at that point, coming out of medicine and coming out of the world that I came out of, which is really about you had to be two steps ahead of everybody else to survive. It was a world of survival. There was more mental focus to, to me as a way of you need to control everything, otherwise you're fucked. You know, right. And then when I realized you can't be in a, uh, an interaction with someone and think you're going to control them. And what you had to do is you had to be as real as you co possibly could be. And in that realness that I would have to bring to the table, it gave the artist or whoever the subject was permission to feel, okay, I, I'm willing to be real with you. Yeah, you, you just described that, you know, in terms of your medical practice, the things that didn't work in terms of the work that you were doing in photography and in, in directing. But what were some of the experiences or the qualities from your from your medical career that you found valuable when it came to the creative? Well, um, I always had this duality from five or six. I was drawing three-dimensional rooms with fairly um, sophisticated um, figures with some kind of anatomical correctness from baby, from childhood. And I was painting and writing poetry at the same time I was playing uh, soccer. I was my first career, if you can call it a career, I played soccer for uh, the South African National League. And that's what I thought I was going to do professionally. And I was drafted. Uh, into the South African League very uh, very early on. And so I could, in fact, at school be a poet and a painter. I wouldn't tell people I was writing poetry and survive because I was a bit of a jock there. And so I had that part going, but at the same time I was fascinated. My father was a, a medical doctor, and I just thought I saw him as an angel healer because he would not only have a rich white practice, but he made a point of going into uh, parts of, um, uh, you know, Johannesburg uh, where he was allowed to go. Uh, white people were not allowed in those areas. And he would see patients and charge them 25 cents. And I used to go in the car as a kid. And, you know, as we drove down these little narrow roads, people knew him and they would say his name. And I was so proud of him. I was going to be a healer like my dad. And that is my nature. And when I talk about healing now, what I mean by that is not in that consensus way of what people think of healing. The message that happened when I went into the hospital in Soweto was I thought we were going to be healing and what was going on is we were fixing. People would come in shot or stabbed or, you know, generally beaten up or severe uh, illnesses because they travel, you know, days to get to the hospital. So what I was just seeing was emergency after emergency, after emergency, and we would sew people up or set their bones and give them fluids and do tracheotomies and, you know, things that you cannot imagine. You know, two, two three days later, we would just send them off. And then two weeks later, the same people would come back. And I just, I went into like, what is going on here? There's nothing changing. 
All that we're doing is just fixing broken down machines behind that uh, coming out of a broken down uh, culture. Uh, so I went into a place where I, I thought I was coming to be a healer, but I'm not. And I, I hit a certain amount of despair about it. And, you know, there were many factors of why at a certain point I heard a voice waking up one morning and it just said, this was three years into running this, uh, the, being one of the people running the emergency unit in Soweto. I literally woke up with a voice that said, you're out of here. Mm. You know, giving up medicine and giving up that stuff, you know, it was a, a, a decision. It was very much like Herbie Hancock as, to answer that question that you asked. He said, I looked in the mirror and I said, who are you kidding? You know, and the fact is he was scared to go into uh, relying on his creativity to survive. So he did what, you know, parents and all kinds of people say, well, you know, you need something to fall back on to. You know, those, I don't know if you ever had that kind of way of saying things. I look at, no, no, you want something to fall forward towards a future. Who do you want to be in the future rather than play safe? But the whole point is there are those turning point moments in people's lives, what I would call a, a destiny decision. And what I mean by destiny here, what de destination do you want to go to in this lifetime? And that was a moment for me of like, okay, uh, I, I can say that I'm not feeling fulfilled in what I'm doing, although I'm doing ver valuable work but it's not feeding something in me that I didn't have a language for. Um, so there was that turning point. So, you know, here I am and I'm having to find some new way of survival, but I always had that creativity in me and I, it was a passion, you know, it was sort of it drove me. I'm sure you had the same thing in your way, a very um, sort of a driven person full of, Mo you know, motivation, enthusiasm, excitement, curiosity, desire to get out there and have your voice uh, become authentic in your mind and also put the voice out into, into the public. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing this amazing show. Yeah. I am a self-described workaholic. And anyone who glimpsed my calendar at any point may ask the question, how do I find the time to do all of that? And I wish I could give you a good answer. I enjoy many of the things that I do, but sometimes there just isn't enough time to get everything done, especially when it comes to self-care. However, I find the time to do that when I invest in a new photo book. I mean, when I get it, I, I sit in my chair, I carefully go through the pages over and over again, and discover people doing incredible things with their cameras. That's why I'm so glad to be a member of the Charcoal Book Club and why I think you should too. Whether you've just started your collection or have been doing so for years, I want to encourage you to subscribe to the Charcoal Book Club. Their selections are awesome and introduce me to photographers I would never have heard of otherwise. You'll enjoy a great new title every month when you become a Charcoal Book Club member if you don't like that month's release, that's okay. You can choose another one of similar value. They offer free shipping to the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. It's subsidized elsewhere. Join the club at charcoalbookclub.com today. And remember to use the code THECANDIDFRAME at checkout and receive a 10% discount on your first membership payment. And we can also do with your financial support if you enjoy the work that we do here at The Candid Frame. Each month requires time, effort, and resources and your donations help us to make the show possible. You can contribute five, ten, twenty dollars or more a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash the candid frame. If you've been thinking about doing it for a while but have never gotten around to it, why not take the time to do it today? It would be a great help. Thank you so much for your continued support. You left apartheid South, uh, you know, South Africa, you know, with the, the racial dynamics that existed there. You come into the states, and you begin working with a variety of, of black artists like Ray Charles, Tina Turner, Ike Turner. What did you learn about 
the racial dynamics in this country, and in particular, your place in it as a white as a white man entering the world, yes, as a foreigner, but never nevertheless having the benefits of, of, of race, but dealing with people who were achieving incredible things. I can only imagine it may be mind blowing to sort of understand how the culture was different and pain, and, pain, and painfully similar. Um, here's an interesting story that I don't know if I've told people, but, and, and let me just characterize something. Everyone has those prejudices within them. It's part of the human nature to be frightened of what looks like the other. Okay. When you function out of the way of saying, I'm looking at this person's physical body and they're not like me and therefore they're the other. There is another way of relating to people, and that is what somehow was inside of me, is what do I feel about the authenticity and the genuineness of this human being? And, yeah, maybe their color is different. I mean, I've got fair hair and look different than other people. So within my culture of white people, and it's really not my culture, you see differences and sometimes you're suspicious. So it, it, there's a human primitive animalistic thing to be sus suspicious of the other. Now, here, here's what was unusual for me. I was born at the beginning of the war, and my parents were basically, uh, my father was, you know, a medical doctor involved. My mother was involved in other things. Uh, my mother became a black woman. Uh, the maid that we had literally was what I call my first love. I fell in love with her. And when I was a baby, I was carried on her back on one of those scarves. Mm -hmm. And the smell of being with, I didn't see black woman, white woman. This was my mother. And she took me under her wing and she would tell me stories and she would take me to meet a lot of these, like, that were probably black shamans. You know, they were called witch doctors. And I kind of grew up in that kind of environment. We were not allowed to have uh, black friends in South Africa. And it turned out that my best friend ended up being a black guy who was, he came to clean my apartment mm. when I was a medical student, you know. And, and so he and I started, uh, I was at that same time doing an, exhi an exhibition of some artwork for a gallery. And I was building all of this stuff. And he, he would come in and he'd look at what I'm doing and he'd say, hey, um, I know how to play in that surface. You, you're not getting it straight. So I started <laughs> saying, oh, would you help me? And he ended up being my best friend. He had to dress up like a cleaner to come and visit me. In other words, he had this sort of white outfit with knee pads and a bucket. So for me to hang out with him, he would have to come over dressed up like that. And then we'd hang out and he would help me in my world of creativity. So my first creative collaborator was this guy right? And I just felt very natural with him. When I came here and I started working, I, I didn't see black people or white people. I saw people that I felt a soul to soul connection. And when people lose the sense of an individuated soul, and they just see people as an ego, then you are in a, uh, a world where you see differences and you see opposition and you see you know, enemy and defensiveness, that to me is about an, an, an arrested development of the human ego. So this issue of race, yeah, you have to say, yeah, I was brought up where you were told all this sort of stuff. That goes into a child, child's mind and it goes into one's belief systems. I did a lot of work breaking prejudice inside of me that was unconscious and I'm including prejudice around women because we were brought up in a chauvinistic world that said, you know, women are, emotions are, imagination is, those are all feminine energies. And But the point is the foundation of creativity comes out of your imagination and it's activated by your emotion, feminine. So, hey, guys, uh, the power of creativity is a feminine energy. I'm not talking about gender. And only later on do you bring in the masculine energy of the action and the will. And that was the way I was sort of learning to start to deal with those kind of 
societal prejudices that are built in. The truth is I found myself relating to black artists and I never thought, oh, black or white when they walked in. I always just thought, he has a creative person, you know, he has mm -hmm. another human being for me to connect. But I feel there was a certain kind of spontaneity and sense of survival when I was working with black artists and black groups that was kind of natural to me, you know, as a white African. But, you know, uh, my interaction at that point, and then at a certain point in South Africa, uh, a whole group of young people my age became anti-apartheid activists. And we went to war, uh, and I'm talking about active war, you know, against the apartheid system. And what I did at that point also was I developed what, I didn't know what it was called, but at the time it was called a safe house because I was hiding one of Mandela's people in my house from the secret police. Uh, he was just a buddy of mine, and I thought, hey, you've got to look after your guy. But if they would have found me, that they, they would have killed him if they would have found him, and I would have gone in that direction. So, you know, this whole thing of race, to me, needs to be looked at from the level of spirituality. Who are we? In essence, because this is just pigmentation, you know, and maybe cultural differences. But who are we really? And, you know, where I look at it, we are consciousness existing in a physical body for a particular period of time. But consciousness is immortal. And that is mind. It's different than brain. But the brain is the way that the ego functions. And if you get caught in the ego, and this is a very long description of how I work with black musicians. Um, you know, I, I had an exhibition recently and someone came in and said, wow, that was really courageous of you to put up so many black um, uh, 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 musicians. It's, it's more black than white. And I went, I did. Let me look at what I've got. I didn't even think about it. But it was, it, to me, it was strange that they had that kind of separation. I just look at it as artists who are real, people who are real, people who have integrity and people who don't have integrity, people that feel intuitively scary because I don't trust them and people who feel intuitively like I can trust them. And I want to be friends with people I trust. I don't want to be friends with people I don't trust no matter what shape or size or color. And, you know, that's kind of important for me because it's like I, I've looked at the racial situation and gone, what's going on? What are we missing? And I think people are missing the sense of the sole uh, nature of human consciousness at that level. It's the individuated consciousness. And that sense of who do I feel is vulnerable and real and trustworthy. Yeah. And then, and then, there's, and then there's the color of the skin. Who, who gives a shit in that level? Yeah. What you just said about being around people who have, who are not genuine, who have, and an, an objective or have an agenda. Yes. Right? And I, I have found through my own self work, you know, journaling, spirituality, meditation, that it uh -huh. has provided me permission to be my genuine self, regardless of any failings or faults that I believe that I have or fears that I have, which allows me, whether it's in a podcast or in a shooting session, to create that space that I'm talking about. But it also helps me with the people sort of outside of that immediate orbit who have those agendas, especially if you're working in the music industry or in Hollywood or, or any sort of high profile stuff where there's just a lot of BS going on. And I feel like it's, it's been invaluable, invaluable, invaluable to me to do that work because of the strength and confidence that it gives me. So my question to you is, is there something that you've practiced in terms of self-work that has helped you to sort of build that muscle? So whether you're taking pictures or directing something that allows you to, to not compromise who you are in your efforts to create something. Yeah, that's the uh, exact question. You have to find out who you are, including willing to be vulnerable about where you think, you know, you have negative aspects or potentials and positive aspects. The vulnerability to me is a positive thing when you can say, I'm willing to allow you to see only to people that you feel you can trust. I'm, I'm willing to let you see my vulnerabilities 
because if I don't see them, then I'm unsafe. The, the safe person is someone who owns all sides. Uh, I've been on a 50 year or more a formal methodical journey of inner exploration through multiple kinds of meditations, many, many schools, many, many teachers, many guides that I can, that communicate to me from other dimensions. I know that we live in a reality that is multidimensional. The physical dimension is, is one level and you can actually access those other levels. Artists, when they're creating, go into their subconscious mind and their unconscious mind, access the source of creativity, the, the imagination at its source, the, the emotions that allow you to be capable of knowing who you are. If you don't know your emotions, you don't know who you are. So I did, I did and I do daily practice, uh, and I see that my creativity was a path to execute what I've learned in the inner journey, and it's a way, and it's a, a it's a, it's a very valuable way to, for self discovery if you if you function with an authenticity. But you know what I've come to understand is it's not enough. So you know, at one point I thought, oh, creativity was the path, mm -hmm. but it's not. You really need to do the what humans are meant to do. Unlike animals, we have the power of self reflection to really go there and see who am I. What do I feel? What am I thinking? What are my motivations? And so that, that's the work that I'm using my creativity in the many forms because I'm now, I'm a filmmaker, started filming my sessions decades ago, and now I've shot, filmed 500 sessions. And I'm using that material and my interactions with artists to in fact be a vehicle for the journey of self-discovery self-awareness for a spiritual journey in a very, very practical, very demonstrable way. It's one thing to use the words. It's another thing to actually practice and do them and be willing to be real and be willing to be vulnerable and be willing to when your ego gets in the way and has an agenda, as you're talking about, it starts being manipulative. So you learn through this work, once you have a, 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 a an intimate knowledge of your emotional spectrum is it's like, you know, well, I give the analogy when I was at medical school and you're doing science and they come and they say, well, here's the periodic table of elements and they've worked out how they all work together. You know, this is lithium and this is what it weighs. And this is how many electrons and how many protons, the, you know, the, the atom has didn't help me in my life. Uh, if I'd been taught the what I would call the the same, uh, the tiers of emotions are like the, you know, that particular structure. Uh, I think it's essential for people to start to become aware of every one of their emotions: their fears, their shames, their rages, their their, their sense of guilt, the shame, you know, that we've been brought up. Once you start to do that work, and you begin to go, oh, right now I know exactly how I'm feeling. And I'm how feeling about this person. Uh, your intuition also kicks in, which is your unconscious already has this knowledge. So for me, the work is making these different dimensions of consciousness become more conscious. So you make your subconscious become more part of your consciousness. And some people say, oh, I did that. It was unconscious. I didn't know I did it. Bullshit. You did it. You wanted it. And you just need to make it aware. Mm -hmm. So, yes, um, I, my, my message, if I say to anybody right now, this is not an automatic reality. We came in here to learn how to become more and more conscious that we are creating our own reality, our own personal reality. We, we write our own story. And I love the idea of working with artists because I'm saying, what's the metaphor of me working with artists? Artists know that they are the authors of their own works. Is that That's a... Fair statement, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. What are they saying? They're saying, hey, through my choices and through my permission that I'm giving myself, I'm going to make this red stroke or this way I move my foot or this note that I'm going to sing. That's my choice. I'm not asking someone else, is it okay? So what I got from my creativity and it was wonderful that I started 
meeting directors and actors and scientists and all these other disciplines, the authentic ones have the same fundamental dynamics of uh, they have a vision, they have a desire, a passionate desire to to become more, to learn, to discover what they don't know. That's why they go, they're willing to go across the boundaries into the unknown. They have self-doubt and sometimes they don't do it well enough. And, you know, the, the real ones will never compromise. You know, they will fight to the end to not be inauthentic. So I began to see, wow, there are artists I work with that walked in with the hubris, like I'm going to be the greatest star of all time. In fact, I already am, you know, you just don't see it. And, you know, I could pick that up emotionally and go, oh, I don't think this artist is going to make it. And there are others that would walk in who were just mind-boggling and would be unbelievably humble. I mean, I'm sitting there with Ray Charles, and he was a little aggressive with me in the beginning. He didn't want, really want to do the shoot. and He was forced into doing it for some commercial reason. And I, I didn't normally do commercial shoots, but they asked me, they said, since this is Ray Charles and most people in the commercial world, world wouldn't know how to work with an artist and would be terrified, I had to work through him being like initially a little testy. By the time we were finished, he was calling me brother. But in the middle, we start talking about this inner world of, the, of creativity and his ability to articulate was astounding. I mean, one of the most articulate people I've ever met. He used the right words to express the emotional thing. And then he plays for me and he says, you know, if I, he's like an actor you know, who has to be emotionally present. He said, if I want to be happy, I make myself happy and then I play. If I want to be sad, I, I make myself sad and then I play. In other words, I'm, I'm emotionally authentic whenever I do stuff. And then he says, and so that's in my little thing what I do, sing my songs to the people, this is what I do. And I'm looking at him and thinking, this little thing that you do and you sing your little songs, I mean, the humility, I mean, he has arrogance in areas too, but the creative humility, that authenticity just blew my mind. Now I'm learning from artists and I'm doing my inner work. And the synergy of those two brings one to what you're talking about, that you could sit here in your sense of, you know that you are motivated by a genuine desire to connect and a genuine curiosity and a genuine a desire to bring something of value to people. That's who you are. That's how I see mm. you. Thank you. Thank you. you know, so that kind of work brings one to that level. When when you started directing, you, you're dealing with a, a, a crew at that point. You're dealing with a director of photography, a grip, makeup people, hairstylists, whatever is involved. How did you find translating what we're talking about the creating the experiential when you're dealing with so many different people to the point that it's not just you and an actor for example but you know you're having to juggle all these people simultaneously how, how does that work for you uh first of all i love it the, the bigger the crew the calmer i get uh <laughs> the part of yeah, uh, the, the, the part of this was when you function in a hierarchical system, and I've seen directors do that and be really shitty to people, when you deal in a collaborative system, it's a community, the person who is the PA that's rushing to get me my banana at 11 o'clock, they used to think I wanted a banana at 11 o'clock because when I became a commercial director, I was the man at a certain point. We were doing, you know, multi-million dollar campaigns, uh, we had to, um, you know, uh, uh, the agency knew that clients wanted certain directors. So they treated me like I was Mr. You know, so, so and so. For me, the PA person who went and got me coffee was as equal to me as my cameraman was. And so I needed to sort of feel that we were working together as a whole and that the, the emotional experience of being on set was sort of fun and people felt visible and seen for who they are. And also when I played soccer, I was always captain of my teams and I learned there that I'm comfortable with um, both making decisions, 
but also being appreciative of what skill sets and what emotional qualities people bring to the table. So, you know, I used to love being on a street with like 20 vehicles and generators. And, you know, I shoot now when I shoot film, I shoot with five cameras uh, because I say to someone, if I'm talking to someone and they're having a good time and their pupil dilates, I want a camera on that pupil. Now, I'm not being dictatorial. I'm, I'm explaining to people why are we doing what we're doing? And they feel like a part of what we're all trying to accomplish, which is to really, uh, in a sense, in the filming, uh, be able to have people literally experience the emotional authenticity or the emotional whatever that's going on because we've, we've observed it. We've seen every piece of, of body language, every piece of physiology, but more than that, the tone of the voice, the way we look at each other, how we breathe, all of those things come into play for me. So that's the journey. And the journey is, you know, when people say, well, why are we here? You know, what, who am I? Why are we here? And I sometimes stop and talk to homeless people and they're all asking the same question. That's how real that is for people. Why am I here? You know, who am I? The way I see it is we are here to learn how to create our own stories consciously more and more, personal stories, and to ultimately have fun being empowered to being the creator of our own reality. Now, that doesn't uh, translate to metaphysical gobbledygook to me. That is very practical. When I work with an artist, an artist is wanting to create their reality through their, cre through their vehicle. You're creating your reality through your vehicle, and you've got multiple vehicles. You're an artist, photographer, but you're a fascinated person with human beings. You are interested in social service in some way. You're wanting to be of service and bring an expansion of consciousness into the world, and that's one of the fundamental areas of uh, service is how do I expand human consciousness? through my own expansion. Thank you for that. My last question, which I ask each guest, is I ask them to recommend <laughs> another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore, and it could be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that one photographer be and why? Um, well, I hate to say I don't really hang out with photographers. and I don't know because it's not my world right now. I don't know who the, the players are. I know in the past there are a couple of really authentic people, but if you can get him, this wonderful guy that just you know put out the book on the Amazon and he's shot all the miners in, uh, what's his name, Salgado. No, Sebastian, yeah, he's, he's, he's been on my list for a long time. Okay, please go and get Salgado. That's the real deal. Well, Norman, thank you. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Norman, thank you for a wonderful but, uh, you conversation. See, I mean, you're shortchanging me because I want to speak to you about you. <laughs> <laughs> we we can certainly do that. Again. You, might have, you might have to come in front of my camera and be filmed. Oh, yeah, it would be my honor to be able to do that. Thanks to Norman for joining us. Find out more about his work by visiting normansheaf.com. And if you're a fan of our work, you have different ways to support us. You can write a review on whatever service you use to listen to podcasts and share a favorite episode on your social networks, be it Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. And you can support us financially by contributing via PayPal or Patreon. Thanks to Randy Bullerwell and Forrest O'Connor for their generous contributions. And if you can't find every episode of the show on whatever service you use to listen to podcasts, download the Candid Frame app, available for both Apple iOS and Android. And because of your generosity, it's free to download and use. No additional purchases are required. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And this is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame.